um, not meeting its promise uh, and being very complex uh, and fragmented. Um, but here, I think a lot of the service providers are really looking to using cloud native principles um, to be significantly more agile, um, to leverage a lot of the technology that's happening in the broader sort of technology space, um, and to get into CICD type principles. Um, and, and I should say, that means that they're moving to Kubernetes. Now, a, a few years ago, I still would have gotten arguments. Um, people would have said, oh, 5G is supposed to be cloud native, but that doesn't mean Kubernetes necessarily. Well, yeah, it does. Um, so I think people here probably recognize that Kubernetes has become the de facto uh, 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 orchestrator for um, containerized workloads, and it is really key to anything you're doing um, that is cloud native. And so I'm going to speak specifically about uh, the networking side of this. So again, these service providers are rushing pell-mell into Kubernetes. And it's, it is interesting that um, when I get onto calls, uh, generally with the customers, I find that there are a couple people who really understand 5G, rarely anyone who understands Kubernetes, or I'm in an alternate reality call where there are people who just understand Kubernetes and nothing about 5G. And getting them both on the same call is virtually impossible, and they don't really understand each other. And um, one of the key issues is that Kubernetes was not created for this, uh, for these workloads, right? Kubernetes really came uh, of age with enterprise type workloads and web type workloads. And so now we're trying to apply telco workloads to Kubernetes. Um, and there are some uh, basic fundamental gaps. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, um, it's interesting, we had one of the original uh, guys from the original team that made Kubernetes come into F5 about four years ago, five years ago, and we were just peppering him with questions about networking and Kubernetes. And he finally held up his hands and he said, look, you know, the guys who are programming this were programmers. They weren't networkers, right? And if you think about it, really, the, the, one of the key things Kubernetes does is obfuscate networking, which is a fundamental issue when your business is networking, right? Um, so there are a couple of ways in which Kubernetes, um, and, and it also evolved, and a lot of the people pushing it were public cloud providers, where there's a certain assumption about the, the infrastructure around it. So we identified three major areas where there are gaps. One is uh, Kubernetes fitting into the sort of broader uh, telco network. And here the thing is, is that Kubernetes is really focused on orchestra orchestrating what's happening within the cluster. And that's really what it's good at, is what's within its cluster. <clears throat> the problem is, is that telco uh, networks are extremely complex, right? You have a lot of separated VLANs and VRFs and DMZs and firewalls all throughout them. And just, just the IP engineering, and anybody who's worked there knows what I mean when I say IP engineering, just the, the IP engineering to get an IP address for a new network function can take weeks. Just getting the tickets through to get through firewalls can take weeks, right? These are very complex networks. And, um, and dropping a cluster in there that has different network functions um, is, is a is complex effort. Um, and so you need to be able to integrate with the routing infrastructure, with the different kinds of, of networks, et cetera. Secondly, um, again, when the 5G stuff, even service-based architecture, uh, was being outlined, um, it wasn't dictated that it be in Kubernetes, right? And Kubernetes wasn't designed for it. So the, the concepts in Kubernetes do not necessarily directly match to the concepts uh, that were defined uh, by 3GPP and so forth. Um, for example, uh, one of the most obvious ones is protocols, right? So, uh, and I'm going to set aside the service-based uh, interfaces for a second, but, you know, diameter is just not a friend in Kubernetes, right? In Kubernetes, the whole concept of ingress, 
which, which is you know, exposing services to the outside world, right, is an HTTP function, period, end of conversation. Um, there are, you know, um, and, and so anything that falls outside of that sort of normal uh, paradigm is problematic. Also, um, you end up working a lot in terms of services, things that are being exposed to the outside world, which are essentially just saying, I'm going to expose this endpoint for you to come reach me. But the thing is, is that network functions are not just things you reach out and, 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 and get to, they're also things that call out, right? And so one of the huge things is the sort of bastard stepchild uh, egress. Um, there's a major problem with egress. Um, and this ties into both of these last two. I have a great example. If you have a packet floating around in your network, you want to know what network function it came from. Because if it came from your AMF, you want to have firewall rules to allow it to reach your RAN network. If it came from your policy function, you do not, right? And so you, you need to have a more complex, a more um, specialized egress function. And tying ingress and egress together is extremely important. And right now, they are just absolutely, totally different network paths. Um, additionally, uh, you have a lot of sort of non-3GPP interfaces or, um, or even in 3GPP, like even in 5G, you have SCTP. And SCTP is a layer four protocol, but it's just not supported in most Kubernetes environments. And when I say Kubernetes, I, I want to make it clear, I'm not just talking about like literal, you know, vanilla <laughs> Kubernetes. I'm talking more generally in terms of Kubernetes and the, the, the patterns and the general tools that people the people use. Um, uh, and plus, many of those tools are not really what I would call um, carrier grade in terms of availability, downtime, uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, um, scale. Um, and then third is about security. So Kubernetes has a fair bit of security, again, within the cluster. Kubernetes feature really focuses a lot on what happens within the cluster. But in terms of how that inter integrates with the broader security uh, uh, policies of the service provider, um, uh, that's just the, 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 they don't want me talking about this stuff. Um, <laughs> this is too secret here. Um, but in terms of integrating with the broader uh, network, it's just not there. And so things like, again, um, uh, integrating with the firewall policies in the, in the broader network, having um, different kinds of, of uh, firewall and DDoS protection, et cetera. So if um, Kubernetes is not uh, really fit for purpose out of the box, if vanilla Kubernetes and the sort of normal tools that people use um, are not really uh, appropriate for, for these telco use cases, what do we do? We have really two options, right? We can extend Kubernetes, and, ex and Kubernetes is built to be extensible, right? This, this is a big, big part of Kubernetes, is that it is extensible. Or you can just break all the patterns and burn, burn it to the ground. And I, I don't have to tell too many people here that there's a lot of burning going on out there at the moment, right? People are trying desperately to get their CNFs running. They're trying desperately to get their cores running. They're trying desperately to get st stuff going. And they're cutting corners, and they're doing things um, that are going to cause them problems down the line. And we are in danger of having another NFV on our, pro on our hands, where everything is so bespoke um, that you can't really uh, translate it from one place to another. So just to talk about a couple of the patterns, um, one of the ones that really uh, drives me a little nuts, personally, um, is every time I hear the word Maltus. Now, Maltus in and of itself is not a bad word, right? Maltus is a uh, meta CNI that allows you to run more than one CNI. And that is extremely helpful. It's very powerful. Um, uh, but in this context, it's always, oh, the CNF vendors all want to use Maltus. They want Maltus interfaces. They want Maltus. And it becomes a code word for wanting to, um, to get around Kubernetes networking. Basically, the CNFs are saying, look, I need direct network access to the outside world. I don't want Kubernetes involved in it at all, right? 
I want direct network access, often SRIV access, and I'm going to manage how the IP addresses are presented. I'm going to manage you know, how it connects to the routers. I'm going to manage all of that. The problem is, is that it, it, it then spills, what you're essentially doing is you're taking Kubernetes, which is this thing that is um, uh, highly dynamic and that is designed to, uh, to orchestrate a highly dynamic environment, and you're spilling out all of the complexity from inside your cluster to the outside your cluster. And it means that the, the owners in the service providers uh, now have to worry about all of this stuff out here. How do they deal with the fact that these containers could drop at any time, and so these IP addresses could come and go at any time, right? They have to manage all of this complexity that is now spilled out um, into the network. And that causes, uh, obviously, operational complexity, um, and it makes IP address management very complex, and also the interconnection between network functions very complex. Security complexity, because now each of those CNFs is directly exposed to the outside. There's nothing to intermediate there, right? Um, and then networking complexity, um, because you're really uh, exposing a lot of the, the, um, the networking complexity. And, and you need to have these, suddenly this CNF needs to be aware of like your VRFs and your VLANs and all of this stuff, right? We see this, uh, so we see this with every single CNF vendor that I can think of. Um, when we uh, first started working, we're, we're in production right now with a large tier one carrier. Um, and literally, and they, they decided to build a, a basically a horizontal stack where they created the platform and they invited CNFs in. Um, every single CNF vendor they had um, asked for Multis, and Multis was this. Another thing we see a lot of is, um, and, and, and I'll tell you, well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, Another thing we see a lot of is creating separate clusters per CNF. Oh, okay, you know, I see a packet. All I know is it came from that cluster over there. Well, that cluster's all AMF, so I'll just let it through. Is that freaking nuts? Like, they're literally creating separate clusters for each CNF. And, um, and, and it, 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 it increases the complexity and the capex and the operational overhead and um, and it duplicates all of the, um, the build stuff that you have to do um, instead of having one large or you know, larger clusters, right? And yet we see this all the time. And the thing is, is that both with this and with the last one, um, a, lot of, a lot of smaller, particularly tier twos uh, or some tier ones, are saying, well, we're buying all from one vendor. So we're just asking them to take care of that. But guess what? Th these things still spill out and become important for the, for the um, application owners because they have to manage things like this outside world. They have to manage having a bunch of separate clusters in their network. Um, what, what we, uh, the approach we've taken is we've created a thing called a service proxy. And um, the name came from essentially one of the first RFPs we responded to. <laughs> um, and it really replaces the, the built-in service proxy in Kubernetes. And it has certain characteristics, and I want to say that these are characteristics that we should be replicating. F5 should not be the only ones with, this, uh, with these features. Um, first of all, uh, we need to use Kubernetes patterns. So we, because a lot of things are not in Kubernetes, we end up extending Kubernetes, and that means a lot of custom resource definitions at the moment, and I'll get back to that. Um, but at least then it is wholly managed in Kubernetes, and all of the pieces should be inside of Kubernetes. The other thing that a lot of the hacks have is external pieces, where you have you know, an external load balancer, you have an external whatever, and then you have to do all this coordination of the configuration of that thing out there and the thing in here, right? Um, with our product, it's all entirely within Kubernetes, and um, there is no GUI, there is no CLI. It's just managed as a part of the infrastructure, which is the way it should be. 
Um, you also need to then have an uh, interface with the broader network, and that really means a lot of solid BGP capabilities, uh, egress uh, network address translations, so that when packets are coming out, you can say, oh, that's an AMF packet, uh, that's an SMF packet. Um, uh, some I address translations, uh, a number of customers have, for example, um, there's a large tier one North American carrier who has an entirely IPv6 network, but some of the CNFs couldn't support IPv6 yet. So they needed IPv4 interfaces, and they had a single stack cluster, IPv4 cluster. And so you had to do translations with every single packet that goes in and out between v4 and v6. Um, there are a lot of those kinds of uh, complexities that you need in order to make these things work. Um, you also need to link ingress and egress so that a CNF presents um, as a single entity. What we do, um, the sort of normal pattern with our software and the, what our customers are doing is trying to fit a CNF within a namespace. And it makes it easier to, to do part of that translation between the Kubernetes concept of the namespace and the, the standards concept of the CNF. Sometimes they're spread across a couple of namespaces, but we try to, to have it either one or a small number that are that CNF. And then you can treat the traffic that's coming in and out of those namespaces as being part of a, sing, a CNF. Um, additionally, you need to support a, a broad number of uh, protocols. So um, everybody says, oh, 5G, it's, it's all you know, service-based interfaces. It's all you know, HTTP2, you're, you're, you're golden. Well, you're not 100% golden. So first of all, it's not all that. Even in 5G, there's the NGAP protocol over SCTP, right? It's not all service-based interfaces. But also, you're going to have very few cores that are pure service-based interfaces, that are pure 5G, right? We're seeing diameter all over the place um, and, uh, and a lot of GTP and other kinds of, of, uh, of protocols. But, but even with the service-based interface, the way it is used is different from normal web interfaces because what it is doing is replacing diameter. And so what you tend to see, just like diameter where you made one connection and you had a ton of traffic for a ton of subscribers going over it, you actually see a pretty similar pattern. Yeah, the, you know, the connection doesn't last for months, but it lasts for a good long time and a lot of traffic goes over it. So the patterns um, are still different uh, in this traffic. And then uh, you need to provide a security layer. Um, and so, for example, we, we have a um, layer four firewall so that you can take your firewall rules that are in your external firewall um, and, and com condense them down, like basically collapse your infrastructure and have the firewall at the point where you're going in and out of Kubernetes, right? Because this is, this is really, a, I, what I'm talking about, the service proxy has nothing to do with what happens inside of Kubernetes. It has all to do with the interface to the outside world, right? And that's where you need to have this additional um, security. Um, and then, um, uh, and then the ability to essentially create a consistent CNF. So when highly dynamic things are happening inside of Kubernetes and the pods are going up, the pods are going down, you're still presenting something as a single CNF. And so, you know, for example, diameter is a good example. Um, so Kubernetes doesn't have a concept of diameter ingress. We have a CRD for diameter ingress. And we present uh, an endpoint. And even if the pods behind us are going up and down, that endpoint is still the same, right? And it ties together ingress and egress because the egress points, as diameter peers do, will initiate contacts to us and we, we're, we're that interface. Um, so again, the service proxy, this service proxy concept uh, solves three things. Uh, it's, it, it fits into the broader network um, because it has a single point of interfacing to that broader network and it has all of the things you need to do that interfacing. Uh, it supports uh, a wider variety of protocols and it ties together ingress and egress. And um, it's a single point for security because once you have that single pane of glass where the traffic is going in and out, um, then you can apply security at that point. Um, and 
A another thing that some people don't think about um, that was really key to our, uh, winning some of the business we've won is that um, service providers don't want to have, for example, if there's an update for SSL security or if they're changing the way they're rotating their certificates or doing something, uh, how they're, uh, uh, what you need to integrate with for security, they don't want to go to all the different CNFs and all the different CNF groups, even inside a single vendor, there are multiple groups usually, right? But, but especially if they have multiple vendors, they want to go to one place to say, hey, we want to change the way we're doing this, we want to update it, rather than waiting for you know, all, their CN all their vendors to, uh, to update. So what I want to get to at the very end, and I assume I am close to the end. A little bit. Yeah, okay. Um, is, again, I don't think F5 should be the only people doing this. Um, one of the problems that I have, again, when we talk to customers, there usually are people who understand uh, 3G, or 3G, 5G, uh, or people who understand uh, Kubernetes. Um, and the diagrams they have to start with don't have these functions in them, right? I, I want to start having those diagrams have these functions. And I want to have it be standard. So one of, one of the other um, parts to this is that CNF vendors want to have something that they can test with a generic interface rather than a bunch of CRDs. Because if they are testing with all F5 CRDs, it's a separate set of tests versus if they're testing with a standard interface. Just to dumb that down a little bit, uh, a lot of uh, CNF vendors right now are using a uh, service type load balancer, right? Well, service type load balancer is relatively limited in what it does. Um, and uh, uh, we have a CRD that does quite a bit more uh, with TCP traffic, but also with UDP and SCTP. And there's resistance to it because they can set up their testing that ends at saying service type load balancer in their service definition, and they're done. Then it's up to you, whoever the, the infrastructure provider is, to provide a load balancer that is, you know, telco grade, that, you know, does everything else that is necessary. They've, they've done their testing, right? Um, I, I want that same level of simplicity, but for these places where there are these gaps. And so one of the things that we are very actively looking at um, is the, uh, the new Gateway API. Um, it currently is in early stages. Um, so there's a TCP route, a um, HTTP route, I think there's a UDP route, um, and a TLS route. But I, uh, I want to, we're beginning to work with that group. I want to start looking at adding in egress, adding in some of these other things. We have other groups that are looking at adding in policies around security, et cetera. But I'd like for us to be figuring out a way to do this in a standard way, using a nor a, sort of a standard Kubernetes API. Um, because otherwise, it's, it's going to end up looking like NFV again, uh, I guarantee. So are there questions? Yes. He's right here. Yeah, I think maybe we need to move the one last thing. Oh. to your original problem about shifting IPs as pods come up and down. One of the reasons why we wanted to find egress is to know what source IP traffic is originating from inside the cluster. How would you handle that with um, your scenario with the service proxy? Yeah, so uh, it's about uh, tying in egress, ingress and egress and IP addresses. Um, uh, I will say that there is a, there is a super nasty problem um, if you want to scale. Um, in, there are a lot of places in Kubernetes, and in again, I'm using Kubernetes in a broad sense, in, in the tools that are used within the Kubernetes umbrella, um, that send traffic to one IP, right? And if you send traffic to one IP, um, uh, unless you have some way of spreading that traffic out in, in an HA way, right, um, you have a point of failure, right? Um, and uh, so we use a fair bit of like ECMP and stuff to, um, to, uh, to get traffic um, uh, 
uh, hashed to, uh, to multiple instances like of our service proxy. Um, but in terms of tying the ingress IP and the egress IP, it's more challenging because um, you don't want to expose the pod IP, right, the internal pod IP, because nothing inside of Kubernetes should be exposed outside. And so what we actually do, we have some solutions for UDP. For TCP, we actually have a separate egress IPs that are used rather than the, the ingress service exposure IP um, because um, it, it's very hard to get a, a symmetric um, packet flow the other way. So yes, that's tough. We have it for UDP and some other, yeah, sorry. Okay, so the two questions are, um, does this uh, sort of eliminate CNI or how does it play with CNI? And then um, uh, uh, do we implement API Gateway? At the moment, we implement API Gateway like more as a demo because nobody else is. So there's no point in our fully implementing it. Um, and it doesn't have the extra protocols we need. So we're in the early stages of that. Um, we're sort of road mapping late next year to have full API gateway um, support. Uh, uh, we could have it sooner, but no customer wants it sooner. Um, but I want to see things like egress start moving into the API gateway before that becomes valuable. Um, the second part, how it plays with the CNI, is a fascinating thing, right? Because the egress, for example, egress is controlled by the CNI, right? It's, it's the thing that sees the packets first on the way out. Um, so what we, we, um, we are working on what we're calling CNI independence um, so that it doesn't matter what CNI there is. And it's a little bit like, um, you know, Istio has a, a CNI that basically puts itself in the data flow uh, before you hit the, the primary CNI. Uh, we're doing something like that um, so that any egressing traffic, any traffic that's going out of the cluster uh, is sent to us and it's essentially invisible to the other CNI. Um, but while we're doing that, we have integrations with a couple specific CNIs, but that just became burdensome. Like, if you're running OVN Kubernetes on uh, OpenShift, we have an integration with it. Uh, we have an integration with Calico. Um, but what I really want is to not worry. I, I, I shouldn't have to worry about what the CNI is, right? So, so we're working on the CNI independence. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Greg, can you? How, how independent or open source this service proxy is? Because you, like cloud native should be like, you know, like you use the same concepts and you can run on any cloud. So if this something, like <coughs> if this service proxy is something special in a cloud, then it's like doesn't really help on our problem. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, at, at the moment what we have is service proxy for Kubernetes, F5, SPK, it is a product. Um, but, uh, and there is nobody else who does all of these things. You can band-aid and hack and script and do a bunch of things to get some of it done, but there is no, no other. But that's what I'm saying about going to the gateway API. If we can make an API that is standard for solving the standard problems that, um, that service providers have, like tying together ingress and egress and some other things, um, then as, if we start using it, uh, other gateways can be valid, um, you know, alternatives, right? Um, because right now you have to use F5 CRDs, which is a valid way to extend um, Kubernetes and their CRDs in use all over the freaking place. Um, but I would really like to see it be more standard. And then, and then each vendor would add their special sauce, right, to try and, you know, stand out from the crowd. But, um, but I think it is extremely important to get to something more standard um, and use a more standard API than the CRDs. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Philip. All right, so as we get ready for the next, um, uh, we have a panel. Uh, next panel is gonna be moving towards envi environmentally sustainable operations with cloud native tools. So if you wanna go ahead and start getting ready. <laughs>